Hello and welcome once again to the Change Exchange, where our guest today is Anton Haber, still halfway head of journalism at WITS, the other three quarters, um, heading up news at ENCA. Is that right? That's right. You're so welcome. Thank you very much. Anton, you started, uh, well, you studied at WITS in the 80s. There was a very strong anti-apartheid movement. Mm. How, how did that shape or influence you? Very much, indeed. I mean, the 80s was a rough time. Um, it was a rough time, um, and I arrived at WITS in 1976, sure. so it was a momentous year. Um, I, I came from a liberal background, a liberal family, um, and I think at WITS I was introduced to a more radical politics. I got involved in NUSAS and student politics at the time and learned, I suppose, a new language of the radical politics of the time. And that was a major influence on my work and my journalism thereafter. Did you get to know a kind or a, a part, a side of South Africa that you hadn't been aware of? Oh, yes, because the politics, even though I grew up in a liberal family, the politics was within quite a narrow, I suppose, white framework. Apartheid worked. <laughs> Not quite, no. Well, it, but it kept us apart. I mean, yes, in that know. sense it absolutely did. But um, I suppose one was interested, introduced to a wider range of politics um, and in, a, a, a range of people one didn't meet in a closeted apartheid society. Mm. And then you started working with the Rand Daily Mail. Tell us a little bit about that. That was a famous newspaper which kind of faded into history. Well, it took me a while to get there. I started, oddly enough, at something called the Springs Advertiser. Okay. Um, um, so you wrote about the fire at the bakery last night. That's right. That's right. And it was good, solid training. And I went to uh, the Sunday Post, which was closed. A lot of papers I worked for have been closed. And I'm not sure I'm always to blame. <laughs> Um, and then I was then involved in the launch of the Sowetan, which replaced it. And then I went to the Rand Daily Mail, where I became political reporter. And tell, uh, tell me about the Rand Daily Mail. Well, the it Rand was... The Rand Daily Mail in the 80s, that it had a very specific kind of place and role. It did. It was the leading liberal voice. And for someone like myself, it was the place to be as a journalist, as a political writer. Uh, it was the place that I think gave the most space and freedom um, to its political writers. Um, but it was at a troubled time because the paper was in the last years of its life and it was under pressure and in decline. And so it was a difficult time as well. How did you experience Parliament, being in Parliament, sitting there? Did you? No. No, you didn't? No, oh. I wasn't the parliamentary correspondent. Oh. I was the political reporter. And in fact, my main work was in fact around extra parliamentary politics. Like? Well, in the, then it was the launch of the UDF. Um, I suppose the, the rebellion that was, that was coming out in the early 80s uh, in the townships and around the tricameral parliament. So a, lot of, so a lot of what I experienced at that time was a tug of war between the demands for coverage of white politics, um, because many of one's readers were white and within that world, and the fact that politics was bursting out onto the street um, in an extra parliamentary way. And that was a, it was a big change moment for South Africa. Hmm? It was a huge, it was a huge, it was the beginning of the whole process. Um, well, I don't know what the beginning is, but a sort of critical transition was, we didn't realize it so much at the time, but the transition was starting. And then after the Rand Daily Mail, you put your own money into starting a new paper. Yes, mainly because we had no choice if we wanted to be journalists. The paper we worked for closed, we were unemployed, we were probably unemployable. Um, so we had this crazy idea of taking the, the payouts we got when we were retrenched um, to put into a new publication. I think we had no idea that it would still exist 30 years later and it would grow to what it's grown. Um, when I look back at the proposals we wrote at the time, um, they were quite modest and not as ambitious. But that's a huge thing. It's both starting a business and launching a new journalistic enterprise. Um, 
how does one build that bridge? How, I always think of Indiana Jones stepping into the void, and it's only when you shift your weight that the bridge appears. That's right. Uh, what are the mechanics of that? Well, let me tell you, the first requirement of doing something as foolish as trying to start a newspaper is not knowing what you're doing. Because if you know what you're doing, you'd never do it. And I remember, in fact, we, uh, we met with Dennis Beckett, who'd started a magazine. And he said, look, the only good advice I can give you is you're crazy, don't do it. <laughs> and we laughed him off. Um, but he was right. We were crazy. Um, um, because we knew nothing about distribution or printing or running a business. Yeah, the business side. The publishing side. We knew a little bit of journalism. We were very young. Uh, but nothing about that side. And we had to learn it very, very quickly. And we had to teach ourselves very, very quickly. What were the biggest um, stones that you fell over? Sure. <laughs> we fell over many because the politics of the time meant that we couldn't find a printer. People were not eager to print. What um, was seen as subversive? Yes, what was seen as alternative at best and subversive at worst. And the Rand Daily Mail had just closed. And we were looking at a small publication. Um, and the small printers were, were nervous and scared. But in fact, I went back to my alma mater, the Springs Advertiser, and they became our printers. And for many early years, until we grew too big, I must say they, they, they were stalwarts in that they stood by us and withstood the pressure and printed us through the difficult years. Tell us something about that kind of feeling of, because I know a number of the people who worked with you then, mm. that kind of feeling of not a band of brothers, a band of brothers and sisters. At the, the, at the, the weekly mail. The camaraderie was extraordinary uh, because we were under pressure. Um, we sometimes had no money, um, but nobody ever hesitated to come to work because their pay was late or didn't come. Um, um, we had to do everything. So we had to, um, we had to, we, we had to fill the newspaper as journalists. We had to produce the newspaper. Um, we then would go home, get a few hours sleep, come back, and wrap it for subscriptions, <laughs> and then get a few more sleep and go out on deliveries. So we literally had to do absolutely everything. So we worked seven days a week, 20 hours a day, and that, that binds you into a very tight-knit group of people who can and have to depend on each other. What did you learn in the process? Sure. Apart from the practical stuff. Um, I, I obviously learned an enormous amount of publishing very quickly. Um, um, but I think I learned, look, it, it, it was, looking back on it, it was very difficult at the time. Um, but it was fantastic times because we were our own owners and editors. Editors are always fighting with their owners, right, with their shareholders. The greatest luxury is to be an, an owner-editor. Nobody could tell us what to do. If we decided to take crazy risks, we could do it. And because we didn't have lots of money and resources or an investment, we could take risks. And so there was that thrill of being able to push the boundaries and do things that others wouldn't do. And what was the, the purpose, the, the, the driving, unifying ideal? The driving ideal was that, that, that we were passionate about our journalism, we were passionate about a particular kind of journalism. It was an activist journalism. Um, what, we what had strong... Mean? Well, we had strong points of view. We, didn't, we, we, we certainly weren't neutral. Um, we nailed our, our flag to, to, to particular masts and said, this is what we believe. This is what we will say as best we can under the legal restrictions at the time. Um, and we saw, us, we saw our journalism as we, we, you know, we were committed journalists. So we were very proud of our independence. But we had no trouble saying we believe and stand for certain things, and we want to see certain. We wanted to see the downfall of apartheid, mm. and we developed a journalism that tried to deal with those contradictions. You started training young journalists at that time. Mm. Um, why did you feel the need? Uh, did the, the universities not? Uh, weren't there enough people coming through? Were they not what you wanted? Um, at the time, we felt that, that many of those coming from the university were not really what we wanted. Um, Why? And not many were coming because the university was, an, was a very academic institution and we found that people came from it 
and they could give us a very good critique of the media, but couldn't write an intro. And we had no time for that because we were, we were under-resourced and too few people, and you had to get down and produce. But it, it was a couple of things. The, the, the one was that we were, we, were a, we were a bunch of white lefties, and we were conscious that if this publication was to have a life and grow, it couldn't remain a white voice. So there was a long-term view that we needed to be more diverse. Um, uh, but also, frankly, it was a way of, of getting support for the newspaper. There were many funders who said, we would like to support your newspaper, but we can't give money to a commercial venture. And so we will give you money for training. That served our purposes. We could go out and recruit um, young black reporters, train them, and get paid to do that. Bliss. Yes. <laughs> Yes. What is the one thing that uh, a young journalist needs to learn? Or maybe two or three things? Sure. I'll give you a little bit more leeway. I mean, you, you have to start with the fundamentals mm. of learning. To describe to the fire at the bakery. Exactly, and get it right, mm. and how to construct a story, and how to verify a story. So you have to start with that. Um, but a lot of what we had to develop and learn were ways of, of finding and telling stories that people didn't want to tell, that the, the emergency restrictions were there to stop us telling. So it was always about how can we tell the story knowing it was in the gray areas of the law and it was risky and you wanted to, you had to, you had to constantly find ways to tell the story um, and disguise the story and get people to read between the lines and use a language in a way that people would know what's going on but often you couldn't be explicit because of the censorship of the time. That's a different skill from what is, you, what is needed in more ordinary times, maybe? Completely different, which is why when that period ended and uh, everything fell away overnight, all the restrictions fell away overnight in 1990, we were caught like, like a deer in the headlights. We said, oh my gosh, now we have to learn Straight to Relearn our journalism. <laughs> we, you, know, no, the, you know, and we were very aware of it, but that transition from being activist journalists to being journalists in a democracy was maybe the most difficult time because we had to relearn everything we did. And of course, it was a time of enormous financial difficulty and pressure as well. If you say relearn, just uh, embroider a little bit. Well, as I say, a lot of the skill was about... Um, finding ways around the law. Mm. In a democracy, one has to learn a new respect for the law, um, uh, which we, ha we, we had grown up in a journalism that had no respect of the law. So all our discussion was, how can I get around the law? How can I get something into print that, that others don't want into print? So it's fantastic skills, um, but you need a different set of skills in a democracy. And that, for the media, that change came overnight because we woke up one day and there were no restrictions on what we can do, not even the normal restrictions in a democracy, because they all fell away and it took a while for new rules to develop. So we had, we had a period of a couple of years of unbelievable freedom mm. where you could get away with anything. Can you remember a moment when you felt we are stretching this, we are using this, we are, this is amazing? Look, that period where we first were free was a very difficult period um, because we knew we had to remake the newspaper. We thought we were ahead of the game. Um, we thought, well, we're now closer to the zeitgeist and the rest of the media we'll are out on the up. edges. We're now at the center of the politics. We're no longer the alternative at the fringe. They're now at the fringe. And we, in fact, started a daily newspaper. We said, well, we can use that to go move into this market with a daily newspaper. But we were wrong. It was a terrible mistake. Uh, because what we realized is that everyone quickly moved. All the big newspapers then quickly moved into what we had considered our space. Um, so suddenly you weren't special? Suddenly we weren't special. Suddenly it, it, it was a whole different thing to be different, to add to it. And suddenly we were head to head with much bigger, more powerful newspapers that controlled all the printing and all the distribution. So it was a very difficult time. Mm. And the funding that had got us through the first five years um, of censorship disappeared. 
which is why many of our sister newspapers dis disappeared in that time. And like fortunately, like yeah, the Afrikaans one, yeah. fortunately, we were the sole survivors. And then you moved into academia. When was it? 2001? So I, I saw through that transition period. We survived partly by selling the newspaper to the Guardian of London. Um, in a sense, they saved us, but we lost that position as owner editors. So I knew that we had to see through the transition, but there would be a time to move on. The time moved on, but I moved into the management of radio um, in Kahiso Media. How is that different? How, how does radio differ from almost everything else? Radio is a, a what is the Latin, sui generis. <laughs> yeah. um, actually, radio is the most simple, easy medium. Uh -huh. First, I loved that. It didn't have the complexities of print. Um, it's really an, an easy medium. And it's, it's not complicated. It's cheap to do, and, cheap to do yeah. and frankly, you do a half decent job and you can make lots of money, which is not the case in print. <laughs> in print. At least. <laughs> not by then. Um, um, and actually, quite frankly, I got bored. So there I was sitting. I had a few radio stations under me which were running well. And they really, it, it, was, it was a bit of a bore. Um, I suppose that's because I wasn't made for a sort of pure management job. Um, and, then, and then the then Vice Chancellor at Wits, Colin Bundy, gave me a call and he said, we want to start a journalism department. Um, would you consider applying? And at first I said no, um, because I hadn't ever thought of doing that. And after a while I said, well, actually, be quite a nice thing to do. What was attractive? I suppose the, the you, I, so I had got out of journalism and I was a manager and I found that boring. Um, so I, it, it, it would take me in a very, from a very privileged position back into the world of journalism. And that's really where I wanted to be. And having talked about the, the uh, problems with young journalists coming out of universities, how have you tried to make WITS different? Very good question. So my vision from the start was that um, we would do only graduate training. So we would take people who already had a degree. Uh, why? Why? Because I think you have to have something to say before you learn how to say it. So I th it was partly a recognition that the demands of, of modern journalism mean that you should have a solid basis mm -hmm. in, in the kind of training you get from a good humanities degree or, or, or the equivalent. We also took people with science degrees and commerce degrees, and that's great. Um, but that's what you want. You want people who have the analytical thinking, curiosity, skills. And who know something about the world. Exactly. Yeah. And then you can teach them how to tell it to the world. Um, um, but we, we developed a program where, which was focused on the practical. Um, the philosophy I came with was students would, from day one, produce media. They would not sit in the classroom. There was, was obviously classroom time, and there was work to be done in the classroom. But they would produce media under adult supervision. <laughs> um, and that was how they would learn the craft. They would learn the craft by producing. Um, um, and so I think we certainly tried to find a different balance between the practice and the theory then it, and it was part of a worldwide shift to what's called the hospital school approach um, where you work on the job where you work mm. on the job and you learn on the job um, so I saw that trend happening around the world and I thought we could be part of that I'm a bit out of chronological order but you also did television and uh, with ordinary people that's correct and how did you experience that because television is a cumbersome beast well, um, so I, I did some television when I, when I was still at the Mail and Guardian. We started what was then weekly mail television. Um, and we produced some, some current affairs, um, a program called Ordinary People, and another couple of programs. And those were among the very first external programs to be picked up by the SABC, by the public broadcaster, in current affairs. Um, but then I suppose in the period when I was a bit bored, um, and missing writing, 
um, we con a group of us um, conceived of the idea of trying to write a drama set in a newsroom. And I think it was part of de me dealing with my history and, uh, and, and my experience. Um, so we wrote a drama. So I, I, we, we conceived of, other writers then took it over, but we developed and conceived of a drama set in a newsroom. Mm -hmm. And did it work? Um, yes, it worked. It did reasonably well. Did you enjoy watching it? I realized I was not a drama writer. <laughs> That's what it taught me, and which is why other writers took over. Um, I realized that I was a journalist, and that was the writing I could best do. I struggled to, to write fiction. The problem with fiction is that it has to be believable. <laughs> and that's much harder mm. than, than writing truth, whether it's believable or not. <laughs> um, um, so I learned that television is a very difficult medium, and certainly drama was not for me. Mm. But you have written um, books, more than one, Deep Sluit yes. and before that. Yes, so at the university, one of the things that gave me was space to, to start writing again. I wrote columns, I wrote a number of things, and I wrote books and contributed to a number of books. And that was me getting back to, I think, what my roots were. That's um, a journalist's dream, actually, to be able to do the longer version. Correct, to be able yeah. to take one topic, uh, research it really thoroughly, and, uh, and spend time really thinking it through and writing it. Um, and I loved that. Um, and uh, I was about to, to go back to spend this year off on another project of that sort and really looking forward to it when I got a phone call to say, why don't you come to ENCA? And again, the first time I said, don't be silly, why would I do that? Um, and then why did you? Why did I? Because <laughs> um, I couldn't resist the temptation of being back in a newsroom. Um, there's nothing, once you've been on, on, once you've been in news, mm -hmm. you never lose it, that passion for the big story. Um, and when you're not there, you're sitting thinking, oh, big story's breaking and I could do it so much better than these bums who are doing it now. <laughs> um, so that's really, and, and, and ENCA is in a particular place. Um, it was an opportunity to learn a lot um, because my my television experience has been limited. Um, and so I'm always open to doing something that's challenging and exciting. And so they won me over. And what do you want to bring to that space, to that new environment? Um, uh, without asking you to criticize what was there sure. before. <laughs> sure. Um, look, my passion is for good journalism. Good journalism that brings for forth the ideas, um, the events, the people that are often ignored. My passion, I think, is for, you know, it's easy to cover the big noisy voices in our society. Um, they're there. Journalism is always available. And you, go to, you can go to press conferences, and most of them have a machinery that feeds you information. That's the e it's important stuff, and it can be interesting. But it's the easy stuff. Finding the stuff that people don't want you to talk about, uh, the voices that are on the fringe of our society and yet are important. Finding the full range of South African voices um, is, is where my passion is, I think, which is why my book really um, takes that on in a particular place. Yeah, the subtitle of your book, Deep Sluit, is yes. What is Left Unsaid. You spent a year researching that. Mm. How did that change you as a person? What did you learn that you oh. didn't know? Yeah, well, it, it, it took, I mean, the reason I did it was it took me into a world I didn't know. I'd never been to Deep Slit. Obviously, I'd never lived in, a, in, a in, an, in, a, in an informal settlement. Um, and How much time did you spend there? I went every day for about, um, for about nine months. Um, I went and I just hung out there, I went to meetings there, I interviewed people, um, I just, w you know, I went drinking there, um, I was just there every day. Um, I chose not to go and live there. There were times I thought, should I come and live here? Then I thought, no, my perspective can only be 
an outsider trying to understand the place, and I shouldn't try and pretend it can be any other perspective. It can't be the perspective of somebody who lives there. Um, so, so you can imagine it was quite difficult going into that situation every day and then going home to suburbia and a very different family life day after day. It actually takes quite an emotional toll. And did you, do you understand something of South Africa that you didn't before? Without any doubt. Um, um, and in ways com that were completely unexpected for me. So, so one of the things I had to learn um, uh, to try and understand and then explain deep through it was how cities work. Because I realized that I needed to understand what the city was doing and not doing and what the blockages were to the city building more houses or building more schools or whatever it was that needed to be done. Um, so I had to read and learn a lot about how cities work. Um, and then I had to read an enormous amount about informal settlements around the world. And what's immediately striking is you read about, you read about them in Zambia or Ethiopia or Latin America or India. And in fact, they're all very similar. And the problem they present to cities is very similar. And that was a real eye-opener. So, so oddly enough, my first response was to learn a sympathy for the city because I came to understand how enormously difficult it is to deal with informal settlements on the scale we have it. And the, and the, and the kind of dinner party conversation that um, the state was not building was schools, useless. was useless, yeah. wasn't delivering everything, just wasn't true. They weren't delivering enough, but the realization was that they could never deliver enough because the pace of demand was outstripping what they could possibly do. So my first response was one of sympathy um, for the task that um, the people running the city faced, and which they weren't articulating. Mm. Communication is always, for me, the, uh, in so many cases, that's the problem. It's, it, <laughs> and, and it really struck home to me that, that here I was, a politically aware, engaged journalist, and I had no sense of, of the challenges facing cities like Johannesburg and how impossible they are. On a more personal note, you've been married to Harriet now, what is it, 25 years? Around Longer, about? no, uh, more than 30. More than 30 years. Yes. What keeps it going? What made you fall in love? Tell me that first. <laughs> well, we met at university, um, and, um, and we were together for some years before we got married. Um, I, I, what made us fall in love? We, I mean, it was, it was an unlikely connection, I think, because we, I think, less so now, um, but we were very different. Um, How is she different from you? Um, I, you know, I was, a, I, was a, I was a hard political activist, and she was a much softer, more rounded, <laughs> uh, different kind of person, and, I, and hopefully... Hopefully she's taught me a bit of that. She's taught me um, a tolerance for, for thinking differently that I don't think I had when I was young. Um, uh, we got married uh, because our lawyer told us we'd better get married. Why? <laughs> <laughs> what did it have to do with him? <laughs> well, it was because... Um, I had been subpoenaed as a journalist to answer questions that I, to identify somebody I knew I couldn't. So the lawyer said, well, if that's your attitude, the likelihood is you're going to jail. Mm. So it's quite a good idea to be married. And we'd been together for some time. Because she needed to qualify as a, as a visitor. As a visitor. And have the yeah. access um, that one needed. Um, uh, so on, on short notice, we decided to get married. We also thought that giving a Jewish mother short notice would stymie her capacity <laughs> to overdo the whole wedding. We were wrong. We were wrong. Um, um, but in between us sending out invitations and getting married, um, the person I couldn't name left the country. So the reason fell away. A reason fell away, and we went ahead and got married, and we're still married some 30 years later, so it was maybe the best legal advice I ever had. <laughs> <laughs> it was maybe the only legal advice I ever followed. <laughs> what keeps it going? 
the marriage. Yes. I think that we we've the relationship. Had, oh, that we've had that we we've, we've kept. You know, we're both in media because she's a television producer. When we have worked together, we have found that's not a good idea. So we've both led quite s parallel but separate lives, both in media. Um, and um, we've always, I suppose, had the understanding that when one is working very hard, the other one is more available. Um, so managed it that way, because we've both had pretty busy, full lives. But you keep the conversation going. Yes, yes. And the, the kids, two children? Um, two children, 10 years apart, which is a crazy thing to do. Um, I would always advise was it, against. Was it a, a decision? Or did it just happen like that? We had one kid. Um, and I kept wanting another kid until I kind of said, well, I'm, one day I said, I'm having another kid. <laughs> you can choose who it's with. <laughs> it took 10 years to get to that. And we had another kid. And of course, I was very, uh, 10 years apart is crazy. Um, but in the end, it's, it's, it's great. How you did know? they change you? And, and children are what keeps a marriage going, I think, in the difficult times. Mm. I think they're very often the glue. A shared um, project. Yes, exactly, exactly. Um, um, so I think that is a, a critical factor. And how did they change you, being a dad? Um, having children is, uh, is, is, is quite humbling because when you're first a parent, you think that, oh, he has this thing I can mold in my image. <laughs> You know, who's going to listen to me and I can, I can, I can Hang teach him. Hang on every word. Exactly. I can teach him to be a great chess player in the way <laughs> I always wanted to be, you know. And of course, you learn pretty quickly that they, they shape you more than you shape them. <laughs> um, and that's the, the, the most striking lesson one learns, I think. Um, that it's, that they're changing your, they're shaping your life much more fundamentally than you feel that you quickly learn that they're their own individuals and you can try and nudge them in a direction <laughs> but your influence um, doesn't last and your home how do you what makes a home you know we can all go rent a place yeah so i think when you when you lead quite um active and volatile working lives as i think we have um then it's really important to have a home that's a kind of place of refuge for, for the family and for one's friends. So, so those friendships are terribly important over the years. Um, the long-term friendships that last through different jobs and different stages of one's life. I think that as, as you learn over time how important that is. So do you have a big table where people are welcome? Yes, what, we do a lot physically, of... Physically, what is, what is your home? We do a lot of, uh, of people around our table. Our house is designed around the kitchen, really. So, so, in our, so and everyone will cook and fight and <laughs> throw things at each other in the kitchen. Um, but it, but so, so I suppose the family for us is defined around a big meal where we'll have friends and everyone in the family will cook one element of it including the kids. Now the kids have taken over and, uh, and they do it. Fantastic. You've brought <laughs> them up well. <laughs> Thank you so much and good luck with your new job. Thank you. Until next time, goodbye.